Good afternoon, everyone. It's been a while since we've visited with everybody, and we just wanted to provide an update and talk to everybody about the status of drought. We've been getting a lot of questions over the winter and as we progress through the spring and what things are going to look like. And so we wanted to visit um, today. We're going to visit specifically about a drought outlook, um, what that looks like in terms of our forage production in both our range and pasture situations and also in terms of hay production. And then to touch on how that might impact our water quality within our grazing systems. So to start out, we're gonna start out with that drought outlook from our state climatologist, Adnan Akus, and I will turn it over to Adnan. Uh, good morning. Um, um, I am going to start with the drought monitor map that was published this morning. Uh, based on the map, uh, you will realize that almost 50% of uh, the state, oh, uh, to, for, to be more exact, 42% of the state is in drought. That puts 173,000, almost 174,000 North Dakota citizens in drought. And that is uh, limited to Western portions of the state. And 24% of that is in severe drought and 7% of that is in extreme drought. And if you wanted to see uh, what the conditions were since, time, since last time when we met, and actually in the winter time, we don't change drought monitor too often. So this is a change since December 8, and you realize that some of these locations in dark green indicating that two class improvement since December 8, and that is due to the progressive snowfall, and, and most of them are limited to where the snow really fell the hardest. And you will realize that some areas in yellow indicating one class deterioration um, in the drought conditions, and that is uh, limited to Western and Southwestern portions of the state. Um, I am going to skip those, but um, I wanted to also mention that uh, the US um, National Climatic Data Center assessed the, the drought impact, economic impact to the uh, United States total, that is $8.9 billion. And this graphic is going to show you uh, North Dakota uh, specific uh, number, that is two to $5 billion. This is a 95% uh, confidence interval and the lower end uh, is in the 5 billion and the higher end uh, lies in the $5 billion. So that shows uh, between 20 to 60% uh, of the U.S. economic impact due to the droughts came from North Dakota. Um, looking at Bismarck and Fargo, accumulated precipitation uh, in Bismarck on the left-hand side shown with the green line uh, against the brown line that is the normal. So uh, it is indicating Bismarck is above normal. And in fact, it is 1.34 inches above normal. And it is sitting at the 17th wettest uh, the water year on record. However, it is important to note that uh, this little flat area is indicating how dry it has been and how lacking the precipitation during the, uh, the periods, especially from January 30 to the last. And the same pattern exists in Fargo, even though the green line is above the uh, normal line, uh, it might be indicating it might be the 24th wettest since 1881. But is what is more important is that that flat line uh, especially after the, uh, the second half of December, uh, the Fargo hasn't been receiving much uh, appreciable precipitation since then. Uh, looking at the past 30 day on the left-hand side, it is the absolute precipitation. Uh, the green colors are indicating uh, more precipitation in the Southeast and less precipitation in the, uh, the Northwestern portions of the state. But what it equates to uh, when you compare it with the normal, map on the right-hand side is the percent of normal. It is indicating between 10 to 25% of normal fell during the past 30-day period. Uh, the next two figures are indicating last 60 and 90-day periods. These are, again, uh, the percent of normal. Uh, the brown colors are indicating drier than normal. And the green and the blue colors are indicating above normal precipitation. However, it is important to note that in the winter time, this puts us in the winter time, and our absolute precipitation is nearly 0.25 inches, even though the area might be showing 200% or twice as much precipitation as normally it would fall, it really doesn't indicate it's a drought buster. It's only indicating 0.5 inches of precipitation fell 
in those parts of the world. Uh, looking at the snow cover, um, still there are some snow cover in the northern portions of the states. And if you wanted to know how much it is, uh, the three inches still in Langdon, Watina is checking in with the five inches and, and the uh, portions to the, the neighbor in the, uh, the eastern portions are indicating nine to five inches of snow uh, still sitting on the ground. Looking at the surface, soil moisture ranking percentile, that takes us uh, the percent or not percent, but the, uh, the soil moisture as compared to the normal this time of the year. And all these brown and the red and dark red colors are indicating very dry conditions. And in fact, the Southwestern and Western portions of the state and all these counties are between one to two percentile. In other words, the soil has only been drier than current condition this time of the year, only uh, 1% uh, of the time. Uh, looking at the deeper portions of the soil, root zone is indicating northwestern portions of the state, uh, very dry and the rest of the state are indicating near normal. And then you look at the, uh, the groundwater percentiles, it is a somber realization that how easy for us to be able to go back into extreme and even exceptional drought conditions, uh, just like where we were in 2021, if the rains really doesn't show up in the springtime. Uh, looking at the 90 day standardized precipitation index, and this is a good index for us to show um, in the current conditions on the field. And as uh, you can tell that the extreme drought locations in the Northwestern uh, portions of the state is indicating um, between D3 and D4 conditions actually. Uh, some of the drought impact coming from the Ward County and the McKendrick County, and I will share this slide for everyone so they could be able to see it. And everyone is reporting in these parts of the world widespread drought conditions and uh, snow is getting uh, out of the equation and, and land is rem remaining dusty and dry. And McHenry County is indicating very same as well as Dunn County and Emmons County. Those are some of the impact reports that was reported in the, um, the National Distribution Center. Uh, some of the uh, draw pictures coming from the same circuit on the right hand side it's a picture of the uh, the pasture. Um, it looks like the feedlot and the, the person who took the picture indicating this is not a feedlot it is it is a pasture. Um, very common um, situations in the area but very uncommon for the spring unfortunately. Uh, looking at the outlooks, this is the moment you probably have been waiting for. Uh, next seven day period that is gonna take us into April 7. On the left-hand side, precipitation anomaly. In other words, departure from normal. All the green areas indicating above normal precipitation is expected. And that is on the Northeastern portions of the state. And unfortunately, um, the Southwestern portions of the state where the precipitation is absolutely needed is not going to have uh, what, what is needed. And in fact, the Southwest, extreme Southwestern portions of the state is expected to have below normal precipitation. Um, coupled with the above normal temperature, much warmer than normal conditions are coming in during the next seven day period. Looking at the um, week two, that is going to be from April 17 to April 14. The map on the right hand side is indicating warmer than normal conditions in the Eastern and cooler than normal conditions in the Western, especially Northwestern portions of the state. And the map on the left-hand side is going to explain why the cooler than normal temperature in these parts of the, uh, the North Dakota, it is because more cloudy conditions that is going to bring maybe much needed promised rainfall up to 1.23 inches of rain is expected in divide and even more in Burke County. Hopefully this is going to come uh, true. Getting into week three and week four, uh, April 9 to 22nd, unfortunately, the models do not have enough skill to be able to break the tie between above, below, or near normal conditions. The same thing could be said for the uh, entire month of April. Equal chance of having above, below, or near normal conditions. Looking at the three months, uh, this is the three month outlook from April through June. And unfortunately, conditions are the same. But when we look at even further into next growing season, this is June through August, 
And if you look into much later into growing season, we will see the same pattern, which is above normal and much above normal conditions um, in temperature and below normal and much below normal conditions in precipitation. Uh, this is alarming. Uh, it may indicate a repeat of the 2021 and for locations that are already experiencing extreme drought conditions, especially in the Northwestern portions of the state, perhaps the condition in 2022 is going to be much worse. Um, and just like before, and I mentioned, this is going to complete the growing season uh, with a period from July through September. And again, drier and warmer than normal conditions are expected. Uh, looking at the flood um, on Eastern portions of the state, we can say that, and however, Western portions of the state, uh, there is no problem with that. Um, the yellow colors are indicating um, near normal, near flood stage, and the brown colors indicating um, minor flood and uh, moderate flood is the, the red. So these are limited to Fargo, Grand Forks, Oslo, Drayton, and Pembina counties in the Red River. And this is limited to Red River Valley. And if I wanted to look at the, the forecast and for Fargo, and the blue line is indicating uh, the forecast, indicating uh, improving condition. The, the stage is uh, going lower. This is 17.4. This is the current. And uh, just today, it is indicating Red River and Fargo just uh, moved out of the um, flood conditions. And on the left-hand side, the graphic indicates the current condition, the leftmost graph, and the second uh, graphic indicate that that is the highest uh, occurrence this uh, season. And the rest of the darker blue colors are indicating highest in, in record. So looking at the Grand Forks and indicating that the conditions are getting better and the stage is getting lower and lower, but still it is in the minor stage. And looking at Oslo, and that is in moderate flood, but the conditions are getting better. Uh, Drayton is actually only uh, along with the Pemina is the only two locations in North Dakota, uh, the peak stage still yet to happen. And this is the Pemina County, uh, still uh, it is in the minor stage. All right, that's all I have, Miranda. Right. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, unfortunately, we know it's been a tale of two states and Kevin and I spent a lot of the winter talking about drought, what, what to expect for the 2022 grazing season. And it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, hopefully Kevin can provide some direction that way. And also one of the things that factors into that is management. And so Kevin's gonna visit about those two factors and what we've been doing at NDSU to help learn more about that management piece. Well, thanks, Miranda. You know, I was hoping that I wouldn't be here this year talking about drought. I was hoping 2022 would lead us into a better year, but much of the Northern Plains is still experiencing drought conditions. Um, I know we got some nice moisture in areas, um, but I thought it, it would still critical for those producers who are gonna be dealing with this drought, you know, can we do some predictions on what to expect for 2022 in terms of forage production? When you look at this prediction, you know, we, you almost gotta look at what happened last fall. And so I, I created a, a map that I took the top 20 end on stations in the state and looked at what happened last fall from August 15th to October 31st in terms of departure from average precipitation to, to kind of get us a feel for were we set up to have a good year or not. And if you look at the state, we were actually much of the state was fortunate to get some moisture. Um, it ranged anywhere from 53% in that Crosby area to almost 180% of, of above normal precipitation down along the Edgeley area. So when you look at this map from the last fall, this is actually a promising looking scenario. It really sets us up to have a good spring this year because of what happened last fall. You need to understand that the, the grass that grows in the fall is what starts to grow in the spring. So when we left last fall, um, we were fairly at least feeling, feeling optimistic that most of the state will have a good year in 2022. Um, the negative of this, if, if you do look at the, the Northwest corner, uh, of, of the state, you'll see that that uh, the Crosby area received about 53% of normal precip during that time period. Williston was at 67%, and Sydney, Montana over there is around 63%. So parts of the area still were low in precipitation last fall, 
And this is really exacerbates what happened last year because of what happened in the fall period. And that kind of that circle kind of shows where we were at. So I wanted to then look at what happened this winter. And so we, much, much of the area, at least western, eastern half of the state got some snow. We were hoping for a little more snow and I hate snow as much as anybody else, but we really needed snow in 2021, 2022. And if you look at the wet, the eastern half of the state, you know, that bottom area had 142% of normal precipitation from that snow. You come down to around the streeter area at 106, but you can see as you go west, as most of you know, we've been out west, we did not get much moisture. The Hedinger was sitting at 33% of normal precip, Sydney, Montana at 53%, which one, my, my, my biggest concern on this was we have no moisture to refill these stock dams or these moisture, these wetland areas that we require for watering in the western part of the state. And so we're going to be looking at, at, a, at a low water levels that Brian's going to talk about a little later on, but that's really where we got the big issue was what happened last winter. And this kind of this, this little circle kind of points out where we can see where we had these deficiencies. And if it's actually, I couldn't make my, my circle go wonky to the right, but you get down to Aberdeen, they were at 70% of normal, even down along the Lytton area, uh, we were a little bit deficient in terms of moisture content. So most of you have seen my talks, uh, you've seen this graph before, and it really shows you when we grow grass in North Dakota. And so if you look at the drought of 2021, we did not get moisture in the spring. And so if, if you look at that period from mid-May to July 1, um, we didn't have the moisture last year. And that's why we had a low production year in terms of not only pasture production, but also forage production in our hay crop. So most of us were lucky enough or were fortunate enough to get fall moisture. And that's the second most critical time period. It sets you up for success the following year. And like I showed you in the first graph, much of the state was above normal for precip at that time period. And at that time period is when we grow the tillers that be begin growth the following spring. And so as long as you didn't graze those tillers off, you will be set up to have a normal spring in terms of production if moisture is at least normal to above production. So I, I, this is a, a picture of a, of a tiller, it's a Western wheatgrass tiller I took last October. This was taken actually around the grassland station. And the growing point of your plants, if you look to the right on the graph that come out of Nebraska, um, you can see where the growing points at on these younger tillers. And it is really near the ground surface. And in fact, on, on the graph to your left on the picture, the growing point is between the bottom two leaves. The positive to that though, is you were allowed to graze last fall. And so the potential to graze some of this regrowth was there. It was positive in terms of helping producers make it through the winter, uh, at least the fall periods. And, but if you did graze that off, it does all actually terminate growth. As you see in the elongation stage of this graph to the right, that elongation elevates as that grass matures out. So most of our plants last fall would have stayed in the vegetative state, which gave us potential for success coming into the spring. The negative to, this, to what happened last year with no snow cover is you do keep yourself susceptible to winter kill on some of these tillers. And so the Western part of the state, we could see some abortion on these tillers that didn't survive. Those that had snow cover will be in really great shape this spring as long as we have the moisture. So let's look at the 2021 drought and fall conditions. And we talk about management. Management drives the vigor of those plants. So we get into next this spring. If they came in the fall, healthy tillers weren't consumed. Production should be in good conditions. This is just a picture of, um, of a slight to moderate use at 65% removal of the grass tissue. These grasses would have came in the winter healthy, tillers would have been in great shape. And so this lives you in a really good condition for this spring. This is a picture showing what we, what we call the take half, leave half concept. Um, this is still a nice ending of the growing season that we shoot for. Um, so you're about full use, 65 to 80% of the palatable plants grazed, but your tillers here, as you can see the green tissue in there would still have not been consumed and will come into the winter and spring healthy. So for those of you who, who really didn't have a lot of choice, you, you, you got the spring grazing. If you're in the Northwest, you got no fall growth and you had to graze these pastures to really survive. Those pastures would have come into the winter uh, low vigor. Those tillers either didn't get them or they didn't survive. And those areas will come into this spring probably in the worst condition. One, you'll get a delay in growth, which means turnout's going to be delayed. Two, you're going to have low vigor, which means production is going to be lower. And if all of the state has any kind of shortage of moisture, 
uh, we're going to see effect at all stages because vigor is low to begin with from 2021, and we don't have much subsoil moisture to carry us over. I'm going to turn it over to Miranda. We're, yeah. we're doing a project, and I'm going to let Miranda talk about that project that relates to this fall grazing. Yeah, so those last photos are actually from a program we're, we're doing with our extension agents. Um, we have several extension agents across the state that are participating, and we're looking at how management during the drought and use last fall is going to impact the ability of those grasslands to recover. And so those photos were actually all from the same county, the same um, same agent and just different uses across that county. And so we'll be going out, we're going to monitor grazing readiness or development this spring, um, growth and then production. And how did that, how does management on these grasslands during drought impact the ability of these grasslands to recover? And this is probably with the, with the way this year's setting up might, is probably going to be a multi-year program where we're looking at long-term how, what happens on these grasslands following drought. So stay tuned, we'll, we'll be posting updates um, as, as we start monitoring and we'll be, the agents will be out there monitoring weekly um, as things start to green up. Thanks, Miranda. So you've heard, heard us talk a lot about grazing readiness. When do our plants reach a stage where they store more carbohydrates below ground in the root tissue than what they actually produce above ground? And so we've always talked about this three and three and a half leaf stage um, and so for native grasses, we typically reach that grazing readiness stage at about three and a half leaves, which is the picture to, to my right. Um, and your exotic grasses like brome grass, crested wheatgrass are usually ready to be grazed about the third leaf stage. So when we, when we talk about this grazing readiness, there's a caveat in the Northern Plains that we almost have to always talk about, and that's Kentucky bluegrass. Much of our pastures are invaded with Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass does not produce three leaves. It produces two leaves then elevates a shoot. And we wanna have a timing in here where you don't wait too late and the bluegrass gets ahead of you. And so you do wanna to, want to look at how much bluegrass do you have in your pasture. And so we tend to cheat a little bit on this grazing readiness when bluegrass is a part of your picture. And so we typically, I typically shoot for about three leaves on my native grasses, two full leaves on my bluegrass, and I try to turn out. So for those of you who came into the fall in what I'd call good moisture conditions, we get normal spring moisture. I think our turnout date in North Dakota would be somewhere around the third week in May to the fourth week in May, depending on where you're at in the state. If you did not get the fall moisture, expect at least a seven to 10 day delay in growth because a new tiller has to be developed in 2022 for you to have success. So think about that in your area and the timing that you wanna match those situations. So when we look at, at some recommendations based on, on um, production and how does this early grazing impact you, the data that, that's been done, this data actually come out of Minnesota, but it really shows how spring grazing, that early turnout has the greatest negative effect on forage production that given year. One is you remove uh, leaf area that you need to capture carbon dioxide and, and, and sunlight. So those plants lose vigor and you give up production. And that production can range as high as 65% in dry years in the Northern Plains. So if you want to get, if, if you don't have much of a choice, think about, you know, delaying that turnout as long as you can through that mid to late May period to try and minimize that loss and vigor that you'll see. And you can see in the other ex examples in this, in, this, in this study here, that fall, winter, ungrazed pastures were very similar. It's that spring grazing that will cause the negative effect. And so try and find strategies within your drought management plans to minimize that negative effect um, will be what you wanna shoot for for 2022. So let's look at re recommendations. And I kind of went through a couple scenarios here. So let's look at, at, when we look at 2022, the key was to allow recovery of those pastures last fall. If you did that and you had the fall moisture, you should be in pretty good shape. Not all pastures, were, that, was, that was the situation. So if you were not allowed to, to delay that grazing last fall, you did get some overuse. Those pastures that were overgrazed in the fall should be deferred from grazing this spring. So look at your pastures and pick those pastures that had the best potential for regrowth in the fall as your starting pastures in the spring. Sometimes we don't, we don't do that normally. We go kind of a rotation that may not fit that to the, to the T, but pick your pastures that have the best potential to have vigor this spring. 
So if normal precipitation occurs this fall, most of the state should experience normal forage production. This is a positive thing that I want you to think about. If you live in the Northwest, I'm sorry. You're not gonna have a great year if we don't have good moisture this spring. But those, the rest of you should be at least expecting good production if we have normal precipitation and plan for that in those certain areas. So if we have a dry spring, and, and this the, based on Adnan's forecast, um, it looks like we could be normal, we could be dry. There doesn't look like much optimistic for a wet spring. Um, so dry could happen. And if, you're, if we have a dry spring, the Northwest part of North Dakota and in the Eastern Montana are gonna definitely have some issues with severe to extreme drought. You're gonna have to destock. You're gonna have to delay turnout. You're gonna have to find ways to, to survive in, a, in a really a third year period of drought because you're gonna severe excessive losses in forage production, both on pasture and on hay production. Last year, much of the state averaged about 35 to 40% of normal hay production, which is why you're seeing the high prices of hay the last few months in particular. Um, if we stay this dry, I don't see much improvement at all for hay production. And you're gonna need to plan ahead for what you wanna do to, to compensate for that. Whether it's destocking, whether you're laying in hay early, think about these strategies. So if you look at, at if we have a dry spring in those areas that did get the fall moisture, but didn't get the moisture in the, in the wintertime, that Western half of North Dakota, I think if we're dry this spring, we're still gonna have a severe drought. The positive is there is some moisture there to get you started. And so if we can get some moisture this summer, I think we can at least be optimistic about having some production. The Eastern half of the state to me is really set up. And this is true even in the North uh, East part of South Dakota is really set up to have a better year than we've seen since probably 2020 that spring. And in fact, that the spring of 2022 for those areas who had fall moisture should experience a similar spring to what we saw in 2020 when we had a really good fall moisture year in 2019. And so this doesn't mean you should be, you should be lax on this. I mean, I, I know we're gonna come in, plants are still gonna be low and bigger. We don't have much subsoil moisture, but at least we have a positive response for this coming year in those areas. So have a drought plan ready to implement by June 1, the latest. I mean, you, you should be starting now, but I mean, in, in, the, in that Eastern part of the state, I think you can look at June 1 when you wanna look at implementing if we stay dry. In the Northwest, I think we should be really getting serious about what we're gonna do for livestock in terms of numbers, culling, uh, what are you going to do for hay if you don't have another hay crop? I know hay prices right now are really out of the roof, especially in the Western Dakotas and Montana. Um, so looking at ways to get in some cheaper hays, line up some contracts. Um, that's what we're already doing that at the grassland station is we're lining up contracts for 2022 to make sure we're covered, just to make sure we have some hay. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Marie Meehan for now. Kevin already alluded to some of the water um, challenges that we had last year and um, surface water continues to be a challenge in the western part of the state we received in one of the updates that we received from a county agent their dam on their their farm is a ranch is lower than it's ever been um, lower than it was last last spring and and the in 2020 it's pretty much dry and without the snow and the runoff to replenish those water availability, if you're depending on those sources, is going to be a challenge this year. If you don't have a plan in place, we need to have a plan in place. Um, hauling water, looking at alternative sources, um, and with th those low levels, we're going to continue to have challenges with um, water quality. Um, specifically, the challenges we've seen last year, and I'll talk about those a little bit more, is total dissolved solids, the salt and mineral component of those waters. Um, and when they get above 5,000 parts per million, we start to see health impacts. And then um, a bigger concern that we've seen here was the sulfates within the, in those water sources. Um, we've seen a lot of water sources that had sulfate issues, animals that had health issues related to sulf high sulfates, so um, some toxicities with that sulfate. Um, the rule of thumb is five, above five, 500 parts per million it could be potentially toxic to calves, um, above a thousand to cattle. It really just depends on their diet. Um, in a forage-based system, that's a little higher, more closer to 2,500. And it also depends on your animals and what they're accustomed to. But if you had issues last year 
Um, even if you're in the eastern part of the state, uh, I don't know that we've had enough to offset those concentrations um, and dilute them. And so really just be screening those waters um, and making sure they're safe, that we have some tools that we can do that that makes it simple. Um, most of our county extension offices have handheld TDS meters and sulfate test strips. Um, so reach out to them and they can direct you the right direction. Also, they can help you um, find some of that equipment if you want some for yourself. It's very affordable, something that you can have in your pasture, in your pickup. So when you're checking pastures and getting ready to put animals out, you can test those water sources. So just a recap of what we've seen in 2021. Um, we tested over 1,500 field, um, field screenings of water across the state. This was both surface and well waters. Most of them were surface, so. Um, and we had 151 that had elevated levels of total dissolved solids and 329 that had elevated levels of sulfates. And for this, it's a greater than 1,200 parts per million just because of the test strips give us ranges. And so one of the ranges is 800 to 1,200. Um, 138 of those samples were sent to a lab and of those 214 locations made some type of management change. Um, I know Craig asked a question about he's seeing higher, I'm guessing sulfates in some of the wells that he's been testing. And that we, we can see issues with our groundwater sources. Um, part of that's the geology in North Dakota. Also um, on some of the updates that, oh, no nitrates. So nitrates, I would look at management around those, those locations. Um, usually nitrates aren't an issue unless you have some type of runoff coming into, into your location. Um, and so that is, that is a completely different issue than, than this. And Craig, get a hold of me and we can talk about that later. But sulfates we can see, and, and I know groundwater levels are lower and aren't replenishing the same as they were. Um, when we have our drought updates that we look at, and will show us those maps of the groundwater levels, and those are behind low normal. So depending what aquifer or where we're accessing and getting those, that water from, we, we can see some changes in that. Um, this is a map of our sulfates that testing from last year. And uh, what I want you to take away from this is that it doesn't matter what part of the state you're in. A lot of, we used to hear a lot before we started this project is water quality is a Western and half the state issue. That's not true. Some of our worst sites, one of our worst sites was in Grand Forks County. Um, and that was actually a well. So it doesn't matter on source it type. It doesn't matter what part of the state you're in. It can still be an issue. So just be careful, test those waters and make sure that it's safe for your animals. Um, the other issue we've seen, and I anticipate we'll probably see again, we've just seen an increase of this in recent years anyways. Um, but when we have hot, dry conditions, we do see increased potential for cyanobacteria. Um, and cyanobacteria produces some toxins. Um, there's two different types, a neuro and a liver toxin or a hepatoxin. And those are deadly to all types of animals and can also um, impact uh, humans in terms of respiratory um, conditions, some rashes. And so we wanna be careful when we're using, when we're, we're monitoring these sources because a bloom can happen very quickly. This location, for example, was I went out at the site that was there one day, nothing, the water was clear. The next day we went back and this is what it looked like. Um, so if we can have a way to monitor those water sources and just be aware of the risk um, of, of cyanobacteria as well. So looking forward planning, um, the, the best solution in terms of long-term drought resilience and even livestock production is looking into a water development. Um, they just increase our flexibility in our grazing systems, increase our grazable acres, um, improve our livestock distribution, but um, also that improved water quality, which will in turn improve our livestock health and performance. So really, um, that's a really, really something I want you to look into in terms of long-term solutions. Um, obviously, we're getting into the grazing system and if you, and it takes a delay to get some of these projects implemented. Um, so 
we have to consider things like hauling water and being creative and how can we use, how can we have a water available that's has an, we have enough water and a good quality water for those animals and still be able to use, utilize the grazing resources we have available to us. Because I know that was a challenge we ran into this year, this past year with some of our ranchers weren't able to utilize some of their pastures because of water quality. Um, there are several programs available. Um, the Department of Water Resources here in North Dakota still has funding available through their drought, um, livestock drought, water disaster water supply program. <laughs> um, and I do believe as long as they're, they're looking into adding additional funding, um, that'll just depend on demand for that program. But there are still funds available through that one. Um, there's always opportunities through USDA and NRCS, some, some of their programs. Reach out to your soil conservation district. Um, the North Dakota Game and Fish also has some programs, Audubon Dakota, Ducks Unlimited, and some of our other conservation groups. Some of them do require cost share, but not all of them. So you know, look, reach out, a good person to talk to would be your, the person in your local soil conservation district office. They would be familiar with a lot of those programs and can help point you in the right direction and find, find one that works for you. So let's end, end with some take home messages. And I know there's been a number of questions brought up in the chat box, but I wanna, we'll end with this last slide and kind of get to some of these questions. But we talked about this last year, we've talked about this for many years now, develop a drought management strategy early in the game. And that includes your livestock, your land, your pasture, your forage. Just think about the whole system as a whole and how you're gonna deal with, with the drought if it continues on in 2022. So look at emergency forage. I know next week we're gonna talk about the livestock side of this and feeding some of these feed sources. And if you're like me, we fed a lot of corn stalks this year. We fed a lot of anything we can get our hands on to feed those cows and still balance a diet. And so we'll talk about that next year. So think about 2022, what a more, what a emergency forages or annual forages you can use in your system um, to create a feed base. And also think about cool and warm season options. I mean, last year we were dry early. Our cool season crops did not do very well, but we got the August moisture and our warm season grasses did very well. And it, it really saved a lot of our producers. If they had a millet or a sorghum sedan grass planted, they were able to capture more production because of those fall moistures. If you need to buy hay, and, and this is a tough call right now because the price of hay is really high in the Western part of the Dakotas, um, but look around for cost. The price of hay right now in the Western Dakotas is almost 100 to 120 bucks more per ton than it is in Minnesota. So look at where you can lay in those feedstuffs. Can you lay in some corn stalks? Are you able to feed corn stalks? It's another, it's a, it's a cheaper feed that if you can blend it off with silage, it's a great feed source to provide some filler and some fiber. Water shortages, I always tell producers, you think about adding water when you don't need it. We all gonna need some water. Arizona need water, so that takes you out of that time right now. But always plan for, for adding water to your operation. When you don't need it, it becomes easier to get access to Sometimes the programs aren't available when you get to those scenarios, but it's a great way to, to invest in your property, invest in livestock performance by having good water. Evaluate your grazing management strategies. What are you doing today that allows your pastures to be more resilient? Um, if you tend to overgraze pastures or you don't have a good rotation system in place, you tend to not be as resilient when we get into a drought. There are strategies in place with management that creates natural deferment and recovery that lets those pastures recover when we do get the moisture. It makes them more resilient. Most grazing systems can get you through a one year drought. Two years drought, we always struggle, um, but resiliency built into the operation is a great way to be ready for a drought. And, and if any indications are what we've seen the last five years to six years in North Dakota, um, we've been dry as many wet years, many years as we've been wet or actually normal. And so I think the pattern right now is Maybe we're in a, in a dry cycle. And so we need to be thinking about how to manage these grasslands to get the most out of them. So I think that's my, our last slide. I think we can turn it over to, to the, any questions on the chat. I know there was one question on, should we be bailing up corn stalks? And my answer to that is, if you can lay in corn stalks for the right price, I would say yes. And, and I say that because yesterday I contracted for 500 corn stalk bales for 2022 that I won't be putting up or get laid in till next October, but I'm able to get it at a better price. And so any forage base that's a safe feed base that's put up properly and you have the potential to blend it off with high quality feeds 
are a great way to cheapen up those rations and get you by during these drought periods. Yeah, we have another one on understanding grazing readiness prior to the three leaf siege. Are we currently seeing grass development versus growth? What's the difference? And so when we talk about grass development, it is developing those different parts of the grass. So the different leaves um, as, as we, and a tiller, um, just the different grass parts as, we, as it grows. Um, and so prior to three leaf, I, we would still be seeing grass development because we would go through the two leaf and the two and a half leaf. Um, but the difference between growth is that it's production. Growth is how tall is that plant? And so we're seeing both occur at the same time simultaneously. Mm -hmm. You know, and a great way to put it, you know, our grasses grow based on day length. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to get one leaf at a certain time of the year, every year, give or take seven to 10 days. Two leaves is the same way. And so that phenology always occurs at the same time, give or take seven to 10 days every year. And so when we get a delay, when we ask for a delay in turnout, or you can go out earlier, it's always in the month of May that this happens. You should not be grazing native rain in the month of April. It is not ready. Um, the other negative too is we can be phenologically ready to be grazed in some years, but because it was a dry year, production will not be there. And so, yeah, I can graze, but the production isn't there. And the bait will come to then, should I be at full stock or not? And usually in dry years, you can turn up at a certain time, but no, you won't have the biomass to carry you very long into the grazing yeah. season. And a great example of that is we were doing, we did a project a few years back looking at grazing readiness and monitoring that. And we seen in 17, um, in mid-May, our Western REIT was at, at the three leaf stage. It was, it was around this, it was delayed in, 18 following the drought, and it was also much shorter when it reached that three leaf stage. Yeah. Um, and so that it was still at grazing readiness, but it was not very tall. Yeah, it's each year's different. Uh, there's a great question here on, on the mixture of native and warm and cool seasons and how, that, how it impacts resiliency in terms of water use. Um, so that what we like to see on pasture is a 60% cool season, 40% warm season in the Northern Plains. That is not the norm anymore. Most of North Dakota runs 70 to 80% cool seasons. And in the Coteau, the Coteau region or, in, or the Eastern Dakotas, it could be 90% cool seasons. So if you do have a fair amount of warm season grasses, you will improve water efficiency because of how those grasses use the cool season, the use moisture. The other caveat is, is those grasses don't usually reach grazing readiness till about mid-June to the third week in June in the warm seasons. Blue grama grass reaches about June 15, give or take. And so you know that if you're gonna rely on those warm season grasses, you almost have to delay a little longer unless you have enough cool seasons in there to, to actually have them capture that moisture. Then when we get the moisture, the warm seasons will be much more efficient because of their, their, their use. Well, if there's no more questions, we want to thank everybody for, jo for joining us. This was recorded. So if you missed part of it or you want to come back to part of the discussion, we will be posting that on our social media. It will also be on um, YouTube under the NDSU Extension playlist for drought and on our, our drought disaster web page. Um, so if you and we'll send out to all participants that link when that when the recording is available. A reminder that we have a, another webinar next next Thursday, same time. And Zach Carlson's gonna lead that discussion um, along with Carl Hoppe and Brian Parman talking about this, the alternatives for feeding, um, knowing that we're gonna to have to keep animals off pasture a little longer, possibly in some parts of the state and delay that grazing. And also the economics behind making those decisions. And I wanna say, you know, if you have any questions or you need any help, you know, contact your local extension agent. They're a great resource that you can use. They have access to those, to the specialists as well. So don't be afraid to reach out for help. And that means any kind of help that you that may relate to this drought. We're here for you. We wanna help you get through this time period. Hopefully the rain will come. We'll have good moisture and you won't need us. That'd be, that'd be the best bet, but don't be afraid to contact, contact us with any questions. Mm -hmm.